today some of us walk through the doors of this church and we put a different outfit on just before we came in. You put your church smile on today. One rapper called them church clothes. You were driving here, everyone was fighting in the car. Kids were going bananas, there's Cheerios everywhere. Anarchy's about to ensue. And then the minute you got into the parking lot, you're like, everybody shape up, we're going to church. And then you're, <laughs> usher greets you. Hey, how's your day? Perfect. You walk in like the Von Trapps all in unison. <laughs> What'd you do? What'd you do? You said to yourself, maybe, maybe in your subconscious or you knew that you were doing it, we can't let people see us like this. I find it interesting that in a world that wants authenticity, we airbrush everything. I find it interesting in, in the world of Instagram, we shout for authenticity, yet we use filters on all of our selfies. And I, f I find it interesting that in a place called church where we want it to be authentic and real, we will work really hard to put our church outfits on, our plastic smiles, to let everybody know that we have it all together when everybody really knows you don't. So I read a story this week about a, a guy named Christopher Thomas White. His picture's gonna come up on the screen. I wouldn't expect that you would know about him, but this man right here parked his car at the end of a trailhead in the woods of Maine and leaving his keys on the dash in 1986. This man would walk into the woods and he would not reemerge until 27 years later at 1.30 a.m. in the morning at a youth camp that he was stealing food from in 2013. This man would be convicted of a thousand burglaries. Now get this, this is amazing. When I look at this picture, because I framed the story that way, how many of you'd agree right now, even in this moment, your, your view on this man is a little slanted right now? You're looking at him just a little bit differently. Can we just all agree mug shots and courtroom pictures look a little different on all of us, right? Okay. <laughs> but what's interesting about this, this gentleman is Christopher White never touched anybody, harmed anybody, hurt anybody, engaged anybody. He didn't talk to anybody for 27 years but he would break into homes at the wee hours of the night or when people were gone at work, he would steal propane tanks and food and clothing. He would never steal money. He would never steal jewelry. He would never steal technology. All he would steal was the necessities needed to live in the woods at his little encampment that he made for 27 years. When he emerged, he had no idea what the internet was, cell phones were, he had read book after book after book. And so when people spoke to him, they said of him that it sounded like they were speaking to a novel because he had been informed and discipled by the books that he had stolen from people's houses. Books and articles and different publications would be written about him. His story became the, like the echelon of folklore. His story would be told around countless campfires and at sleepovers, scaring everybody who listened. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. He became the boogeyman to this North Pond community in Maine. After his arrest while sitting in prison, many, many reporters would try to get with him, but one specific reporter got an extra amount of time. They, they created a relationship, a trust, and. So this particular reporter was able to engage him in a way that no other reporter was able to engage him. And in one interview, he would express great amount of shame over the fear that he instilled in people over his 27 years of living in the woods. Can you believe that? 27 years. He would talk about barely surviving winters. He talked about a mushroom that was on the side of a tree that he watched grow over 27 years. His stories were, were stories that you couldn't even really write yourself because of his experience that no one would really ever set out to do, his off the grid 
living. But this is what he said in one interview, and I, and I found it fascinating. He said, when asked, did you ever examine yourself, ask questions about your, yourself, try to figure yourself out, this is what he said. He said, I did examine myself. Solitude did increase my perception. But here's the tricky thing. When I applied my increased perception to myself, listen to his words, I lost my identity. With no audience, no one to perform for, I was just there. There was no need to define myself. I became, in his words, irrelevant. He says, the moon was the minute hand, the seasons the hour hand. And he said, I didn't even have a name. As I read the articles and the features about the North Pond Hermit as he would become known as Christopher White, I could not help but find myself thinking about this moment that's captured for us in Genesis chapter three, verses one to 10. In a moment of great shame, and after seeing themselves as exposed and naked for the very first time, like Christopher White, Adam and Eve would venture into the woods in order to hide. They would venture into the woods in order to hide themselves from the presence of God. They would venture into the woods so that they would not be seen in the presence of this God who wanted great community and time with them. Does that sound familiar to anybody in church today? See, the power of shame, if we really think about it, its greatest power is the fact that it causes us to hide. The greatest effect of misplaced and broken identities is a drivenness towards hiding. Maybe here's a better way to say it if you're taking notes today. I'd love for you to write this down because I think it's important to acknowledge this, that shame-filled things have a tendency to hide. C.S. Lewis, with great insight, would write concerning shame this powerful statement. He says, I sometimes think that shame, mere, awkward, senseless shame, does as much towards preventing good acts and straightforward happiness as any of our vices do. In other words, what he's saying is he says, you know that, that, that alcohol that you consume as much as you possibly can of to drown out the pain? He would say shame is just as powerful or more powerful than that. Those drugs that you work to take in order to stop your mind from moving around so much, he actually says shame is just as powerful as those things. You know that, that corporate ladder that you work to climb in order that you would get affirmation and recognition in order to push down the thing that's in your soul? Shame is just as powerful as all of those things. And that's why I actually think if the, if the devil can get us shame filled, he doesn't have to get anything else into us because shame will cause us to hide. Now, let me pause for just a second. That was a really heavy intro for some of us today because we're processing. It gets really, really quiet in this moment at the beginning, but I want you to come on a journey with me today. Is that all right with everybody? I want us to, to stare this thing called shame down. But shame's difficult for some of us to stare down because it's a very, very abstract idea for us. For many of us, we chalk it up to simply an emotional or a feelings-based concept. But, but here's what I wanna suggest to us today, that shame is much more complex and deeper than just mere feelings and emotions. Because how many of you know me, feelings can change really fast? In a nanosecond, but shame doesn't. How many of you agree with me today? Right? How many of you know that joy, you can have it in one second, like happiness, and then, and then that emotion shifts in just a second? You could be super happy in church right now. You're loving this moment, loving this moment. And then you get out to find out that somebody bumped into your car in the parking lot. How many of you know your, your emotional state just changed? <laughs> so, so feelings, while they're wrapped up in shame, shame is deeper and more complex than feelings and emotions. Kurt Thompson in his book, The Soul of Shame, writes this. He says, shame is something that actively and intentionally attempts to shape the stories we are telling ourselves and others. Okay, I need everybody to engage with me. How many of you, truthful moment, can we just be honest in church today? How many of you have ever told a story about yourself and put a little bit of glitter on it? How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
How many of you like, just, just stretch the lines out just a little bit to do what? To do what? To make the story a bit more interesting, to, to, to frame yourself in a certain light. We've all, we've all told stories about ourselves that honestly, maybe we didn't know it or not, but shame was actually reshaping the way that we were telling it. Because we're working most of the time to present ourselves a certain way. We're all trying to shade things one direction or another. Shame is often elusive. It shape shifts to fit the context of our lives, causing destruction and pain in our situations and relationships. In other words, hear this today, shame is not a neutral player on the field of our identities. And because shame is so potent and and powerful, it often causes us to, to reorient and reinvent our stories. And here's a statement I really want us to hear today. Focus on these words. Shame causes us to break union with authenticity, drawing us away from truth and causing further descent into our forest of shame. You know, I'm acutely aware that today some of us walk through the doors of this church and we put a different outfit on just before we came in. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You put your church smile on today? One rapper called them church clothes. Because you know, some of you, come on, can I talk to the, to the parents in the house today? You were driving here, everyone was fighting in the car. Kids were going bananas, there's Cheerios everywhere, anarchy's about to ensue. And then the minute you got into the parking lot, you're like, everybody shape up, we're going to church. And then you're, <laughs> usher greets you. Hey, how's your day? Perfect. You walk in like the Von Trapps all in unison. <laughs> What'd you do? What'd you do? You said to yourself, maybe, maybe in your subconscious or you knew that you were doing it, we can't let people see us like this. I find it interesting that in a world that wants authenticity, we airbrush everything. I find it interesting in, in the world of Instagram, we shout for authenticity, yet we use filters on all of our selfies. Y'all see what I'm talking about? And I, f I find it interesting that in a place called church where we want it to be authentic and real, we will work really hard to put our church outfits on, our plastic smiles, to let everybody know that we have it all together when everybody really knows you don't. <laughs> I find it interesting that in an age where we want authenticity, we will do everything in our power to hide from God tricking ourselves into believing that we've fooled him. Am I talking to anybody in church today? Commenting on what shame does to us internally, one author writes this, shame causes us in the privacy of our own minds through isolation to judge what my friend, how many of you can just recognize, we've all been there at one time or another, to judge what my friend, my enemy, my spouse, my child, my employee, my boss, my pastor, person who cut me off in traffic, school board member or barista is really thinking and feeling about me. You ever been there before? Have you ever taken the person who cut you off in traffic so personally? Come on, let's just be truthful in church today. You're like, gosh, what do they have against me? Nothing. They're just a bad driver. You ever thought to yourself, like, man, what's wrong with my barista? What's wrong with her today? What did I ever do to her? Nothing. Her dad just died a week ago. Man, what's wrong with Pastor Kaisa? <laughs> she always walks past me after the third service in the lobby. She never says hi to me. Why doesn't she like me? You have nothing to do with it. She sat through the third service and she has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> listen, listen to these words. Shame causes a type of narcissism that believes the whole world is against us. It's why we are experiencing great degrees of shame. We tend to be trigger happy when it comes to our emotions, whether it be anger or sadness, apathy, indifference, or even, even joy. In his book, The Search for Significance, Robert S. McGee gives what I believe to be a very succinct definition of shame and its application to our lives and, and identities when he writes this. He says, shame often engulfs us 
This is the book that we're actually going to be studying in all of our formation groups uh, that are actually live today. You can join those formation groups. They're our version of small groups, so we'd love for you to, to get on board. But we're going to be studying this book. Shame often engulfs us when a flaw in our performance is so important, so overpowering, or so disappointing to us that it creates a permanently, a permanently negative opinion about our self-worth. See, here's the funny thing about shame is that shame is not just attached to sin that we commit or sin done to us, but oftentimes the shame that you and I carry is because we didn't perform the way we wanted to in the areas of life that we wanted to perform well in. And be sure about this, there is a defining of self-worth. It has a genesis, it has a point of reference, it has a defining source, and that source is God. So when seeking to understand how and why shame impacts the way it does, we must first understand who we are and who we've been made to be. And so the Genesis account gives us great insight and understanding into who we are as created beings, made in the image and likeness of God, the Imago Dei, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. Now, here's what I want to say to us today. If you've been a part of this church for any length of time, I'm about to tell you about a miracle that's just taken place. I have no points for you today. Okay, but I do have A, B, C, D, and E that we're gonna work through. <laughs> they are not points because they are A, B, C, D, and E, okay? And this is gonna be a 35,000 foot view. I'm gonna go through them really, really fast. And then here's what I wanna tell you. The next five weeks of this series, we're gonna unpack each of these things. This entire series, look at me when I say this, this entire series has been leading up to this moment. The questions that you've had, the whatabouts, the, the, the things that you've been like, okay, where are we going with this thing? It's all gonna be talked about over the next five weeks. I know that's a big promise, but once you hear what we're, the, like when I scan over these things, you kinda hit, you'll kind of get it really fast and go, oh, I, I see what's happening here. So in his book, Known by God, author Brian Rosner identifies five things that human beings are according to what we see in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Here's the first thing that we see that human beings are is human beings are special. Come on, return to your neighbor and say, you're special. Every turn back to your neighbor and say, I know. I am special, guys. Okay, this is what the term special means. It's not gold star. It's not performance oriented. It's not because of your giftedness or your talent. It's not because of your good looks. It's not anything like that. This term special that's used is a term that describes a set-apartness from the rest of creation. One theologian writes about this specialness as he says this, the man receives life, listen to these words, from the breath of the creator himself, hovering over him. Breathed is a warmly personal, it's, it's face-to-face intimacy of a kiss and the significance that his was giving as well as making and self-giving at that. In other words, what this theologian is saying is that you and I, as human beings, I want you to listen to this, okay? This is so important. You and I, as human beings, are set apart from everything else because you and I were created by the very breath of God. He breathed into you and I. Humanity, if you go back to the beginning of Genesis, is this beautiful picture of of God gathering dirt, gathering dust, and it says that he breathed his breath into us and it animated that dirt and it stood up and it wobbled for just a moment like a baby deer and then it walked in the confidence of the breath that was in it. He said to the land, separate from the sea. He said to the birds, you are in the air. He said to the trees, you go up. But to everything else he said it would be, but to you and I, he breathed life. So guess what? You're not like those mountains out there. Why? They don't got breath in them. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. No breath, just let there be. But to you, humanity, what does that make you? Special. It makes you special because you contain something that nothing else of creation contains And we're gonna dig into that beginning next week. The second thing we're told that humans are is that we're social. Some of you are like, yeah, I know. (laughs) 
Social references are designed for relationship and connectedness. Brian Rosner writes this, he says, we are embodied in as such our social in nature, defined by our interdependence and responsibility to and for each other. Our minds and our hearts enable us to think and feel and thus to build and sustain relationships. So we're gonna talk about relationships over the next few weeks and why shame is one of the greatest issues that our relationships actually face. For the married people in here, I actually believe communication is not your problem, shame is oftentimes. You don't have a talking problem, you have a shame problem. Oh, I'm gonna push it further just because it's the third service of the day. You don't have a sex problem, you have a shame problem. Married couples, married couples. <laughs> just gonna be very clear about that. For the rest of you, that's a problem. Um, Here's the third thing that the Bible communicates to us in Genesis is that we are sexual. Speaking to the unique design, designation, and definition of, here it is, male and female. Yep, we're gonna go there. Boy, oh boy, that'll be a fun message. Once again, Brian Rosner on the theme, he says this, Genesis 2 is unique among ancient Near Eastern accounts of creation with its focus on the creation of woman. Genesis 2, 23 to 25 makes clear not only Adam's need for a mate, but also for the differentiation and complementary roles of male and female, the incompleteness of one without the other, and the norm of sexual intimacy. It's captured in Genesis 2, 24. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked. Here it is. They felt no shame. Y'all tracking with me today? Okay, let's pause for just a second. This, over the next five weeks, is gonna, we're gonna push into some territory that might be maybe uncomfortable for some of us and for other of us, you're like, full send, let's go, let's do this, so I'm in. And I just wanna encourage you to, to be here for it. We're gonna go for it. We're gonna, we're gonna get after some theology and some academic realities. Here's the thing, how many of you agree with me? Light and fluffy is not cutting it in church anymore. So, because you asked for it, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> And we're going to get after some of these things. And so the third thing that we see is that we're, we're sexual. Uh, here's, the, here's the fourth thing that we see about, about humans is that we are moral, contrary to popular opinion. We see this in God giving Adam and Eve the power of choice after his established command concerning the fruit in the garden. Within the framework of morality, we see the design of rationality as well. So we're both moral and rational. We have the ability to compute through things. Paul the Apostle comments in one of his letters, uh, specifically Romans, of the descent of rationality amongst humanity as we trade worship of the creator for worship of the created. We descend, we get wild and out, it, get, it gets crazy. Theologian John Lennox writes this, he says, here are the basic ingredients that define human beings as moral beings. God has given them the ability to say yes to him, not by eating the prohibited tree, and to say no to him by eating of it. In this way, the Bible introduces us to the idea that human beings are moral beings with all that implies. In other words, you and I are not animals. Thank you, one. I'm gonna go over here to the person that. Let's try that one more time. You and I are not animals, okay? So in my feed in YouTube the other day, because of some of the stuff I've been researching, the algorithm through some like, uh, through some like animal documentaries up into my feed, right? Like, wild, like Animal Planet and stuff like that. So I clicked on one the other day and the commentator came on. Maybe you've, you've watched these before. And the commentator right at the very beginning of the segment said, you see, animals and people aren't so different from each other. As I watched a monkey throw stuff at his friend. <laughs> and I thought to myself as I was watching this, I'm not doing that right now. We are vastly different, but we have a culture right now that would try to convince us that the base level of who we are is animalistic. So here it is, hear this. Culture will move us down to the bottom of the ladder to be your most base feelings and emotions and desires. But God tells you that you are actually at the top of it, this created special being. So in a world that would tell us that God debases us, it's actually not true. God elevates us and the world is trying to pull us down 
to be nothing but armadillas. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody in church today? The last thing we're told is this, is that we are spiritual. We're spiritual. And this is the idea that we are entirely defined by our relationship with and the correspondence to God, our creator. Adam and Eve were created, listen to this, you and I were created for presence-oriented communion with God. They walked and communed with God in the garden. Shame caused them to hide from that communion. So we're gonna explore these five areas in depth starting next week. Shame, church, will ultimately work to distort that which was created and declared originally as good. Good. And shame, if we're honest about it, has reoriented many of our stories. Ladies, shame has reoriented some of your stories. Men, shame has reoriented some of your stories many of your stories. And I know for some of us guys, that's like hard to admit because you're like, man, I'm a man. Shame ain't got nothing on me. But I'm like, after seven seconds of talking to so many guys, I realize shame's got everything on us. It works itself out differently in the uniqueness of who we've been created to be, but so many of us are living in this place of shame. So here's my declaration at the beginning of these next five weeks. Shame off of us. And then here's the greater reality that I want us to know, that according to scripture, there is a cure-all for shame. That is the good news today. Come on. Come on, can we praise God for a second? There is a cure-all for shame. And it's found in Jesus. So I wanna introduce us to one of the most beautiful theological truths that we find contained within scripture. One of the most beautiful theological truths that we find contained within scripture. Paul's gonna write to Titus. This thought is captured in Titus chapter three, verses one to seven, listen to what Paul writes. He says, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. He says, stop living anarchist lives. He says, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. And then he says this, for we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Oh, but here's the good news in verse four. But when the kindness of God, our savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of, here it is, big theological term, one of the most beautiful in, 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 in scripture through regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Christ Jesus, our savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This big truth, regeneration, is one of the most beautiful gifts we have in and through Jesus. Regeneration is the cure for shame, church. It's the answer to the fall of the garden. Once again, from Search for Significance, Robert S. McGee, he comments on this and he says, regeneration, listen to this. And some of us need to get this today. This is, this is vital, it's important for us. Regeneration is not a self-improvement program, nor it is a cleanup campaign for our sinful natures. Regeneration is nothing less than the impartation of new life. He goes on to say, regeneration is the renewing work of the Holy Spirit that literally makes each believer a new person at the moment trust is placed in Christ as Savior. Hear this today. When you and I say yes to Jesus, he makes you brand new in that moment. You don't perform into newness. There is not enough Bible verses to read that make you new. That's not taking away from reading the Bible. There's not an amount of small groups that you can attend that make you new. 
You can help as many people across the street as you want to, and it will not make you new. You can go to as much church services as you want to go to, but it will not make you new. You can live by all the rules and do all the things, and those things will not make you new. There is only one who makes you new, and his name is Jesus. There is only one who died for you. There is only one who was buried for you. There is only one who resurrected for you. There is only one who conquered death for you. There is only one who sits at the right hand of God, and his name is Jesus. There is only one man who makes you new, and his name is Jesus. Here's my question. Is there anybody in church today who loves new things? So you're all skittish. You're like, should I say that in church? Come on, show of hands. Where are my people at? You like new things. Okay, now think back. Do you remember when your parents, if they did, ever took you to get new shoes? You remember that? Some of you know what I'm getting ready to talk about. You remember, I remember my mom, she'd take me to, I remember the first time I walked into Foot Locker and I was like, this glorious heavenly smell of brand new shoes. And do you remember the first time you put those new shoes on, the guy got them all fitted? Remember those metal things that you had to stick your foot in and they'd like scrunch your toes and they come in and they put the shoes on you and they tie them for you. And then do you remember the first thing you did when you got those new shoes on? You took a run down just like, and then you yelled across the store, they make me faster. You remember when you put on Jordans for the first time and you're like, I could jump higher. Remember that? Why? Because there was something inside of you that believed that the new thing you had put on changed your abilities. Because there's something, whether you believe it or not, there's that presence of faith that lives inside all of us. So you put on new shoes. You thought you could walk, run, and jump faster, higher, and better. For seven minutes, you believed You were the next NBA all-star. You were the next fastest person on the planet. Watch this, watch this. Ephesians 4, verse 20. Paul says, but that's not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life. The old self, what is that old self? What does scripture tell us? That old self's corrupted by deceitful desires. It's it's shame drenched and broken. Paul says in Christ, I want you to take that off and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. What is that new self? That new self is the one that was created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Here's the thing, when I put on the new self in Christ Jesus, all of a sudden the systems and patterns and beliefs and ideas and functions of my life, they start to change. You cannot behave your way into newness. You put it on and everything else follows because there is a new operating system that's taking place on the inside of who you are. Some of you are trying to break things in your life by working and pushing and white knuckling it. And all you need is a new operating system. A change from the old. And when you put the new man on, the new woman on, that is made in the image and likeness of Christ according to his truth, supernaturally, you change. This is a supernatural faith, church. 
This is a Pentecost faith church. We believe that there are some things that science can't explain, math can't explain, philosophy can't explain. Come on, somebody. There are things that we believe only Christ can do inside of us. You want your behaviors to change? Change the system. You want your thoughts to change? Change the system. You want your actions to change? Change the system. You want your feelings to change? Change the system. Take off the old and put on the new. You will run different, you will walk different, and you will jump different to the glory and the praise of Jesus. And the church said, amen. 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 And amen. Next week, I want to invite you to be here. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor. Let's walk through these next six weeks as a journey of freedom. And as we head into the summer, I pray that we would do it knowing that who the sun sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' mighty name. For some of us today, as you bow your head and close your eyes, right now all over this room, all over auditorium too, I want to invite some of us out of hiding right now. And we do it by acknowledging Jesus as Lord. We do it by acknowledging him as savior. We do it by acknowledging him as the one who frees us. The question is not whether you believe in him or not. That's a part of it. The question isn't whether or not you know him. The question is, is have you said yes to him? Have you made him Lord of your life? And if you have not today, I wanna invite you into doing so. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're gonna pray a prayer all together today. Don't wanna leave anybody out, both of our rooms. But if you'd say, man, Jason, I need to say yes to this Jesus you're talking about today. Come on, would you pray this with us today? All across this room so we don't leave anybody out today. Everybody say this as loud as you can. Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me, change me make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me new. Thank you for regenerating me. And I'm deciding today to walk in the newness that you have given me. In Jesus' mighty name.